There you go. All right. <laughs> Once again, welcome and thank you so much for being here. Today we are going to talk about current public health crisis. Dr. Holtz will share with us um, about racial disparities uh, during COVID and Dr. Lawrence will talk about policing as a public health crisis. I will introduce Dr. Holtz first and then um, we'll hear from her and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Lawrence. So a little bit of information about Dr. Hose. She is the Robert Wheeler Professor of Population Health and the Director of the Health Equity Program at Rose College. She is also an Associate Professor of Religious Studies and teaches the popular course Space Health and Justice, which introduced students to health inequity, especially among racial and ethnic minorities. Dr. Hose directs a grant from the Andrew Millen Foundation to support health equity education and deepen existing community partnerships in Memphis. She is also the co-author of several books such as Dust and Breast, Face, Health and Right, the Church Should Care About Both. She serves as faculty in residence at the Center for Bioassets and Health Equity at the Browner Children's Hospital. We're really glad to have you here, Dr. Holtz. Thanks for the invitation. I'm really glad to be here. And I am happy to see, I'm looking at the names on the screen and it looks like we've got a crew of, of uh, folk that I have met in other contexts. So some of you will have heard some of this before, it should sound familiar, and I hope that soon you will start feeling confident to present material like this yourself. So what I'm going to do is um, show you a bit of data. Uh, related to COVID-19 disparities. And then I wanna talk about some explanatory mechanisms for understanding why these disparities are happening. I wanna start by acknowledging that race and ethnicity are not black and white, but I am going to be focusing primarily on African-American disparities in this talk, just for the sake of keeping it relatively simple and fitting it into about 10 minutes of me talking. I wanna leave as much time as possible for Dr. Loins and then for us to have some follow-up uh, conversation. So please notice that I am talking here about racialized disparities, not race disparities. That's a very important thing to remember because race is not a risk factor for anything. It's not race that produces disparities, it's racism that produces disparities. And so what we're thinking about here is how we are racialized, how a social gaze makes us legible as white or black or Asian or Hispanic or indigenous. And um, it's that social gaze that racializes us that will ultimately be the explanatory mechanism for these disparities. So, um, all right, first let's just look at some data. This is data from about a month ago. And so the way COVID works, it's outdated, but you can see the trends. Um, this is just four states comparing uh, infection rates in African American communities to the, pop to the population. So in Mississippi, which is 38% African American, 72% of the deaths from COVID-19 have been among African Americans and 56% of infections. In Illinois, which is just 15% African American, 43% of deaths and 28% of infections. In Michigan, 14% African American, 40% of the deaths have been among African Americans, and 33% of infections. One thing you'll notice here is not only is there a disparity uh, in the rate of infection, there's also a disparity in deaths. So even though 56% of the infections have been African Americans, 72% of the deaths in Mississippi. And look at Louisiana, 33% African American, 70% of COVID-19 deaths have been African Americans. This is Shelby County, which the whole county is about 54% black and 41% white. The city is um, a higher percentage African American, but we're looking at county data throughout this presentation. What you're seeing here is that, um, wow, my old eyes are having trouble reading those numbers, is that we have about 57% of our infections um, are among African Americans. So there's a little bit of a disparity there. 54% of the population of the county, 57% of infections. Oh, actually, I'm looking here at the death, I'm sorry, this is the mortality data. And 
oh my goodness, somebody with better eyes than me helped read that. I think it says 67%. So um, the infection rate in Shelby County is about 57% for African Americans, but the fatality rate is higher than that. So 57% of fatality, sorry, 67% of fatal fatalities from COVID-19 are um, African American. And by the way, this data is updated almost daily on the Shelby County website. So you can go and click through and get this data quite easily for yourself. I, I just took these as screenshots about an hour before the presentation. I wanted to make sure I had the most recent data. So it's the kind of thing you can keep an eye on yourself. Here's what's really starting to trend um, in our awareness and concern. This has to do with the Latinx population of Shelby County. The Latinx population is about 6% of county population. That's by census count. So it may be somewhat undercounting our Latinx um, residents. But look at that infection rate. 28% of infections in Shelby County are um, Latinx. And so we're getting seven times the representation um, Latinx population versus infections. So that's an enormous disparity and something we need to pay a lot of attention to. When we look at where these disparities are coming from, it helps to look at a map of Shelby County. So this is a map from June, and I'm gonna show you a map from today in a minute. I wanna use the one from June for a minute because it's a little easier to read the graphical representation. What you're seeing, I hope you can see my mouse on the screen right here, just to get you oriented. Um, Overton Park is right about where my mouse is, about where this blue dot is. This is where Rhodes College is. Across uptown, the Smoky City Klondike neighborhood, Nutbush, Hollywood, coming down through being Hampton, Orange Mound, and then across South Memphis. What you're seeing is that the neighborhoods that are most densely populated with African Americans are also the neighborhoods with the highest infection rates. This is the map from today, okay? and you can see that it nearly mirrors the map that we had from earlier in June. It looks like the uptown, I can't get my mouse to show up, it looks like the uptown area has done somewhat better. This map also extends Shelby County over the river line so that you can see a little more clearly. But we're still, here's the Jackson Corridor, right? We're still looking at the same areas, and this area, of course, is fairly densely populated with our Latinx residents. Still coming down through being Hampton, the University District, into Orange Mound, which is the hottest spot in Memphis, and then across South Memphis, we're getting our highest infection rates. Okay, why? Why is it going on like this? The answer, is, the short answer is racism, that our society is structured in a way that made this completely predictable and I'm gonna give you five quick explanations of why that is the case. We need to start by thinking about our evolutionary heritage and what that means for how our bodies um, fight um, infections and process disease. So we evolved in a context in which the greatest threat to our health was a predator. And those who survived those contexts were the ones who had a really strong fight or flight response. So when you perceived a threat, when you sensed that you were not in control of a situation, your body would kick into fight or flight mode. Your adrenal gland would produce a lot of cortisol, which would get pumped into your bloodstream, making your heart beat fast so that you can run away, releasing a coagulating agent called fibrinogen into your blood so that you don't bleed to death if you're injured, and slowing down how quickly your body uses up blood sugars so that you have a ready source of energy that lets you fight or flee. But also, that, um, that now the name for that sort of how much cortisol you've got in your body is allostatic load. Um, if you have a high allostatic load, it will also prevent you from getting sleepy. You'll have disrupted circadian rhythms. The reason for that is that when you're in contexts of threat, you need to be wakeful. You need to be ready for whatever's coming at you. And so you don't want to get sleepy just because it got dark outside. The thing about having an allostatic load that's elevated is that it's a really good thing if you're being chased by a bear. That is a stress that is acute and episodic. 
you get away from the bear or you don't. And in either case, you can stop being stressed. That's a joke that doesn't even work very well when I'm in person. Okay, so at least I saw one person crack a grin. All right, so we evolved for acute and episodic stresses, but racism isn't acute and episodic, it's systemic and chronic. And that means that your body senses that you are out of control, that you live in a society that doesn't value you as an individual and won't protect you when threats come your way. Your body doesn't know how to respond to that kind of systemic and chronic stressor. And so it kicks into the only mode it knows, which is fight or flight, that leaves you with an elevated allostatic load. If that happens, and you keep that wakefulness over time, those disrupted circadian rhythms will eventually suppress your immune system, making you more susceptible to infections like COVID-19. But also, it will make you more susceptible to the kinds of comorbidities that result in a more serious course of disease. So, remember, your heart is racing. If your heart continues to have that kind of elevated rate, that's gonna be associated with cardiac disease. If your blood stays thick from that fibrinogen, that's going to be correlated with blood clots and strokes. And if your blood sugar levels stay high, that is the very definition of type 2 diabetes. And so what you're seeing is that a racist society is producing the conditions under which African Americans and other stigmatized populations are much more likely to be susceptible to infection and then to have a more serious course of the disease after they're infected. Here, you're looking at the rates of fatalities based on comorbidities. And what you're seeing there is that cardiac conditions and diabetes are the two most highly correlated with COVID-19 infections. And those, of course, are the ones that are driven by um, these um, uh, socially determined diseases. But also look at respiratory condi conditions. Another big disparity we see based on environmental racism, which is to say that we put our toxins in neighborhoods that are predominantly African-American, um, we also get higher rates of asthma in those neighborhoods. And those higher rates of asthma will produce these kind of a, a comorbidity that will exacerbate the course of a COVID-19 infection. Okay, why? A third explanation is that because poverty is racialized, we have a higher percentage of our essential workers who are in conditions where they cannot practice social distancing. And so if you think about what your warehouse workers are likely to look like, what your cashiers, who are working in circumstances where customers may not be wearing masks because they think that represents an infringement on their freedom, those, those uh, essential workers who are least likely to be able to practice social distancing and most likely to live in dense housing situations where they can pass infections more readily are also likely to be racialized individuals. And here we can see that, that there's a long history of that. This is the redlined map of Memphis from the 1930s. Uh, in the 1930s, the predecessor uh, department to the, what is currently the um, uh, Federal Housing Authority um, made maps of all the metropolitan areas in the US and they ranked each neighborhood for riskiness. If you were ranked as a very risky neighborhood, you were redlined, that's the pink areas on this map. And being redlined meant that you were essentially impossible to get public or private investment to um, improve your neighborhood. And segregation meant that you couldn't choose to move out of that neighborhood. So again, look at this map and compare it to the one we saw of COVID-19 infections. Here we are moving across Uptown, Klondike and Smoky City, um, Nutbush and Hyde coming down in this way toward, uh, this is Binghampton, moving down, this is Orange Mound, and then we're coming across uh, South Memphis, which is, this is the kind of C rating, which is just bare, just one step above the um, redlined areas. And these are our two most impoverished neighborhoods, 38106 and 38109, they're up against the river. So compare, you're looking at the same map. The map in the 1930s that determined where people would live 
that they would not be able to build home equity, that we would produce the conditions in which it was nearly impossible to build intergenerational wealth, is also the same map that we see showing this um, COVID-19 outcomes. Okay, last, just two more explanatory mechanisms. Why was it predictable that we would get higher rates of COVID-19 infections and fatalities among African Americans? Two more re reasons, healthcare. Um, you need access, you need insurance, and you need to be able to trust in the healthcare system. And if you are a low wage worker, if you don't have insurance, the state of Tennessee did not expand Medicare under uh, the Affordable Care Act. It's really fascinating to compare our health outcomes with, with Kentucky, which did, um, and has some very similar demographics to us. Um, so a, a lot of our um, African Americans and other uh, racial and ethnic minorities simply do not have access to health care. And if, for very good reason, they often don't trust health care. And so um, we've got a disparity on that front as well. And then finally, we have disparities once you get through the door of the clinic. We have a disparity in, we, that's caused by bias. So we've got good data from February and March that showed that when white people showed up in clinics with flu-like symptoms that did not test positive for flu, they were referred for COVID-19 testing. When they were identified as infected, they were able to isolate, to quarantine, and to avoid passing that infection on in their communities. But African Americans were just sent home. And that meant they were sent home with infections that they spread to other people in their community. And because this infection spreads exponentially, it was completely predictable that you were going to get an explosion in infections in African-American communities. And then finally, another form of bias. Um, this has to do with our triaging systems. Who gets a ventilator? Who gets respiratory support when they have the kind of worst case of COVID-19 uh, possible? Well, uh, there's a computer algorithm called Apache 2 that determines how we distribute those healthcare goods. And Apache 2, simply, it's supposed to be kind of uh, value neutral. It looks at how likely you are to experience organ failure over the next 24 hours. And to determine that, it, um, it looks at your comorbidities. So if you have comorbidities like hypertension, cardiac disease, if you have uh, diabetes, then you get a worse Apache score than somebody who doesn't have those conditions. And that means all things being equal between two people who both need a ventilator and there's only one ventilator available, it's going to go to the person who doesn't have those comorbidities. And that person in our current society is much more likely to be white than black. And so what you see here are five explanations of how racism produces these disparities in COVID-19 infection rates. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Holtz, for helping us understand how racism um, contributes to the disparities in COVID time. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce Dr. Lawrence and pass on to him to talk about policing as a public health crisis. Dr. Lawrence is an assistant professor of urban studies and Africana studies at Rose College. His courses uniquely combine philosophy, religion, culture, and justice. Currently, his research studies the broken relationship between Black communities and law enforcement. Important frameworks he applies include unconscious bias and critical race theories to understand the convoluted anti-Black state violence in the U.S. Furthermore, Dr. Lawrence is a founding faculty member of Rose College post back Certificate in Health Equity. In the community, he coaches students and healthcare professionals on how to minimize implicit bias as with patient-provider relationships fighting against healthcare inequalities. Dr. Lawrence is also active in many news outlets as he provides commentaries and write articles. Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, first, I wanted to thank um, MCSC for this wonderful series of webinars on systemic racism. I was present for Dr. McKinney's amazing presentation last week and was also present this past Tuesday to witness uh, the great session led by Dr. Stephanie Cage and Ms. Vita Ajamu at the National Civil Rights Museum. 
Systems Museum. And as always, it's a pleasure uh, to share space with my partner in crime, Dr. Kendra Holtz. Uh, this is the second day in a row we're uh, working together and it's always a pleasure. Um, before we begin, I wanted to plug something that's happening at Rhodes College. Um, in the months of May and June, Rhodes College convened a series of panels on the COVID-19 pandemic. And we looked at COVID-19 from a wide variety of perspectives, uh, including history, science, education, racial disparities, et cetera. One of the participants in that series, uh, the amazing Dr. Aixa Marshan, who teaches at Rhodes in our educational studies and psychology departments, proposed that we would have a second series looking at the other pandemic that's grippling, grappling, grip, that's gripped our national attention this summer, namely the fractured relationship between black communities and law enforcement. So Dr. Marshan, uh, Dr. Holtz and I started plotting and we put together a series of panels that will look at policing and protests from a wide variety of angles. Now that sounds interesting to you. I've got good news and bad news. The bad news is that the first panel was last night and it was excellent. County Commissioner Tammy Sawyer, Reverend Dr. Earl Fisher, and a new professor at Rhodes, Dr. Earl Wright, one of the leading sociologists in the nation, did a marvelous job of framing the current national debate around policing and protests. Um, but I've got good news. We have two more panels left. So the next one will be next Wednesday, July 15th at 7 p.m., where Dr. Charles McKinney, Dr. Luther Ivory, and community leader Rashawn Austin will help us understand the history of black protests and the history of policing in Memphis. And then the third and final panel will be in two weeks, um, Wednesday, July 22nd at 7 p.m., where Dr. Arcandria Owens, Dr. Chrissy Lipford, and I will look at the role, the toll that policing takes on black bodies and what we need to do moving forward. In fact, in many ways, my brief comments this afternoon will serve as a prelude to that session. Um, you can register for these panels at roads.edu or you can watch them, uh, each panel stream live on Rhodes' Facebook page. Now, I've spoken about the relationship between black communities and law enforcement a lot this summer and in fact, a lot over the past year. In fact, uh, in the fall, I taught an entire course on this subject entitled How to Get Away with the Murder that dealt with this subject. Typically, when I speak on black communities and law enforcement, I do three things. I contextualize the anti-black violence in, at the heart of law enforcement. I provide a history of law enforcement in the U.S., which is drastically different from the mythological origins of policing that we prefer. And I talk about the various measures that we use to attempt to, quote unquote, fix policing. I'm going to do a little bit of that today, but today I want to go in a different direction. On November 13, 2018, the American Public Health Association, the nation's largest public health organization, voted to adopt a policy statement that declares that law enforcement violence should be viewed as a public health crisis. This is them rallying before the vote. Now, this was an important policy shift, and it was a critical victory for a lot of us who've been urging a recognition that police brutality, in addition to and apart from the direct violence of death and bodily injury, should itself be seen as a contributing factor to the poor health outcomes experienced by black bodies since the dawn of this nation's history. And at first glance, this may seem odd. So we know that policing is a political issue, yes. You may say, well, policing should be a moral issue, definitely. You may say that policing is a human rights issue, absolutely. Two weeks ago, the Shelby County Commission declared racism a pandemic. And two days ago, the Memphis City Council declared racism as a public health crisis. So we get that, but the question is, how do we connect policing to health? So for just a few minutes, I wanna connect policing and black communities to public health. And then during the q and I will be happy to take all of your questions, health related or otherwise, regarding policing. And so I have to set the context. I know, I know several of you on this call, I don't know everyone. So I wanna give you a little bit of background on my particular stance on policing in black communities. So there are two problems that I've uncovered with policing. The first is in the United States, the ways in which we have constructed black bodies. The actual racial categories of black and white, as we all know, are social constructs. They're just some stuff that at one point we essentially made up. But they're not categories that we made up that are relatively innocuous, right? What color is your hair? Whether you have an any or an Audi belly button. Rather, these categories were created with more nefarious goals in mind. Essentially, blackness was created to mean that black bodies are more prone to crime, more prone to violence more prone to hypersexuality, that black bodies are more prone to being dangerous. 
phrased another way, and here my students will recognize that I'm about to dig into one of my favorite theoretical frameworks. Blackness was defined to mean social death. And this comes from a wonderful scholar in the 1980s who wrote a book called Slavery and Social Death, Orlando Patterson. Now there's a lot packed into what social death means, but let me give you two that I think are relevant. First, it meant to be black was designed to mean that you were open to gratuitous violence. Gratuitous meaning there doesn't have to be a reason for it, right? So at the basis of our understanding of what it means to be a black body, it automatically has always meant that you could be violated and there didn't have to be a reason for that violation. Your blackness alone meant that you were open to this measure of violence. But secondly, blackness meant general dishonor. We all understand the idea that if you do something in a society that the society by and large determines to be wrong or incorrect, that you will lose some social status, right? We all understand that. But the problem with blackness has always been that you are by nature generally dishonored. It's automatic. It's not anything that you do. It is your ontology, your essence. My students at Rhodes know that typically when I talk about social death, I'll add something that Orlando Patterson did not add, which is this idea that black children are, quote, accelerated into deviant adulthood. This phrase comes from Stacey Patton, who's founder of Spare the Kids, and she's getting at this idea that Black children never have gotten the luxury of just being children. They, was, they were always accelerated into being treated as if they were not just adults, but deviant adults, right? Studies indicate that Black children are perceived as being older, larger, and more prone to being bad or, or misbehaving than their white counterparts who are the exact same age. And we see that in history. Emmett Till in Mississippi, not too far from where we are in Memphis, probably did nothing wrong, but was still treated worse than a grown adult who had committed a heinous crime. The Central Park Five, hopefully you've seen the documentary on Netflix by Ava DuVernay entitled When They See Us. They were aged 14, 15, and 16 when they were treated terribly by our criminal justice system. Tamir Rice, uh, the call that came into 911 when Tamir Rice was killed, and I'll bring him up a little bit later, said, quote, shots fired, male down, black male, maybe 20, as in maybe 20 years old, when in reality, um, he was only 12 years old. So there's the construction of black bodies in America that's part and parcel of the problem we have with black bodies in law enforcement. But then there's also the way that we've constructed law enforcement. Police forces, by and large, are not an innovation necessitated by an increase in crime. Police were created, police departments are responses to crowds, not crime. So we see this in a variety of ways. We see this in the early 1800s when immigrants, German immigrants, Irish immigrants, etc., they were immigrants back then, now they're white, but back then they weren't, were protesting against unfair working conditions. And in response to those crowds, the elite said, we need some sort of force to tamp down on this, and there you have the advent of police forces in many cities. In the South, it was response to crowds, namely free black bodies. But also the context of the formation of police departments has always been a context of social inequity. In relatively egalitarian societies, you really don't need, for, you don't need formal police departments. In addition, most of early policing, much of early policing had to do with controlling outdoor space. And we've seen that in the protests, right? We've seen that um, people who want to exercise free speech, people who want to uh, engage in political protests, people who want to enjoy themselves are largely policed and somehow um, um, controlled by law enforcement. And then it's important to remember that historically, law enforcement agencies have ser served as violent control mechanisms to maintain white supremacy. So much of what we see in policing in America has to do with controlling, controlling, surveilling, restricting black bodies to maintain white supremacy. This is an important point because when we talk about policing in black communities, we tend to go toward brutality. We tend to go towards the, the unjust killings that are caught on camera. Those are important, but policing functions to control black bodies in a wide variety of ways. Now, let's talk about health. Lately, there's been a lot of talk about health equity, but we need to define health. So I found that the World Health Organization and the preamble to their constitution has some very helpful ways to help us conceptualize what health means as we think about law enforcement as a public health crisis. First, health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. 
So health, this is important. Health is not just not having a disease, being quote unquote physically fit, whatever that means. It's a state of being completely physically, mentally, and socially well. Second, the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being without distinction, distinction of race, religion, political belief, economic, or social condition. But I've highlighted race here because what they're saying is you have the right, it is a fundamental human right, regardless of your race, to have or to be in a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. And then thirdly, and there's a lot in the, the preamble to the Constitution, I'm only pointing out three things that I think are relevant. The health of all peoples is fundamental to the attainment of peace and security and is dependent on the fullest cooperation of individuals and states or nations, right? In other words, you cannot have peace and security unless you have health. You cannot have peace and security unless you have health justice. So if you don't have health justice, you can't have peace and security. No health justice, no peace. So this helps us to get at what we mean when we talk about um, health equity. What is the concept of health that we're getting at? So let's briefly, and I won't be long, look at some ways that policing impacts the health of black communities. And let's talk generally first, and we'll talk about a few specifics. First, there is the direct harm of bodily police violence. When I taught the course on black bodies, uh, black communities and law enforcement, how to get away with murder, one of the mistakes I made is that I had students do reports on very popular cases of uh, police brutality or vigilante brutality against black bodies. And typically, I think every um, case that was studied was someone who had been harmed or murdered, right, which is important. But I think the next time I do it, we're also going to focus on people, and actually this is a majority of people, black people who engage police officers, who aren't murdered but who may be uh, harmed in ways that will affect them the rest of their lives, right? So we'll talk about that next time around. But so obviously one health impact of policing on black communities is the direct harm of bodily police violence. Secondly, the actions of law enforcement inaugurate your entry into the criminal justice system that compounds structural social, social economic factors. So you heard Dr. Cage talk about this with mass incarceration, right? It's law enforcement that gets you started in that process. And once you're in that process of the criminal justice system and in the carceral state, parole, probation, that will compound structural and social economic factors that will lead to the deterioration of health outcomes. Third, there are a number of studies that show that fear and trauma, especially in children, actually has the capacity to change our hormones, right? To change, change uh, our, ourselves at a very physiological state. But I want to talk about children just for one minute. Um, you may have seen this on social media. Um, a young African-American girl was walking with her mother and a police car pulled over and the police officer started walking over to talk with the young lady. And I don't know if you can see it in the photo, but the young girl immediately, when she saw the cop, started crying uncontrollably, and she put her hands up. She raised her hands. And, you know, the officer was just there to talk about it. So the general mean, mainstream media spin is, oh, you know, look at this. This girl was afraid. But don't worry. The officer was nice and just wanted to talk with her. Um, I reject that. What concerns me more is the terror, the terror that this young lady had at the sight of a law enforcement officer approaching her, even though she was well aware that she did not do anything. Here's another story that was in the uh, media just two weeks ago. Um, a father of a nine-year-old son was reviewing his um, home security footage, and he saw his son kind of playing shooting basketball. And then, I don't know if you can see it, I have a circle here. The kid was just playing ball. He looked down the street to his left, and he saw a police car approaching. So what did he do? He calmly walked behind the family's vehicle, while the police car passed by. And when the police car had passed by, he then came out and started shooting basketball again. What are we doing in this nation that our children have terror at the very sight of law enforcement officers? And how is this possibly affecting their health long term? Another thing to talk about regarding the trauma and the stress and strain of law enforcement upon black bodies and communities is that it is intergenerational. So black people grow up hearing stories from their parents and their grandparents and hearing stories about people in their communities and growing up to have children and fearing for their children, fearing for their grandchildren. Another thing about this is that this harm is vicarious. You don't have to experience it yourself as a black person to still be impacted by it. I experienced this a few years ago. In 2016, I was teaching at a seminary, and I was kind of the go-to person on all things criminal justice, incarceration, police reform, et cetera. 
And in 2016, I was talking about Tamir Rice. Uh, Tamir Rice was 12 years old, young man in Cleveland, playing by himself when a police car showed up and uh, the, cop, the car had not even stopped before the cop came out of the car and shot and killed him. And I made a mistake in that presentation, the same mistake I'm going to make now, so I have to be very careful to control myself. I was trying to explain to these, this white audience what this does to black people. And at the time in 2016, my son was 12. So I put up a photo of my son. And so I asked them a question that wasn't theoretical. I said, what do I do as a black parent in a world in which black children who are 12 years old can get blown away by police officers with impunity by playing in a playground? What do I do when my 12 year old son is home and his two white friends who are neighbors come and knock on our door and ask me if my son can go play with them at the park? And I looked at this photo and I broke down at that point and started crying. And I couldn't stop. And I was talking to a friend uh, a few days after that and you know, sheepishly sharing what happened. And he's a, a well-known respected professor in New York State, uh, accomplished scholar in every, every regard. And he shared that one morning he woke up thinking about Tamir Rice and he said he just couldn't get out of bed. He started shaking in his bed and just couldn't stop crying. There are the general, general mental health challenges due to consistent over surveillance and brutality by law enforcement. And again, constant stress. And my colleague, Dr. Holtz, always does an amazing job of explaining the role that stress and the overproduction of cortisol does to our bodily um, physiology. So those are general impacts of policing. Let me close with just three examples specifically of why policing should be considered a public health crisis. Um, a few years ago, Joshua Legewi, a Harvard sociologist, did a study focusing on the state of California and looked at data from 2,000 police shootings and 3.9 million birth records in the decade from 2007 to 2016. And this comprehensive study, just looking at one state, found the, the following. When an unarmed black person was killed by police within one kilometer of a black woman's home during her first or second trimester of pregnancy, the birth weight of the infant was significantly lower than individuals not exposed to violence. Low birth weight increases the chances of future health problems, diabetes, heart problems, heart disease, learning disabilities, delays in social development. But the study also found that pregnant black women who live close to sites where law enforcement killed black individuals were also more likely to give birth prematurely. So these are people who aren't being directly impacted themselves, but they are taking in their own bodies the trauma of something that happens unfairly in their minds to people who live near them, right? There's an identification there. Now, this study did not find the same thing happening when you had police shootings of unarmed white or Latinx uh, individuals, and there's no correlation between the birth weight of white or Latinx in, uh, infants, right? But another study did find this. Um, there was a federal immigration raid that took place in Postville, Iowa in the year 2008. At the time, this was the largest single site federal immigration raid in US history. And guess what they found? Latinx women who were pregnant had a 24% greater chance of delivering a low birth weight infant compared to women in the same community in the year before the raid. Just being in proximity to this injustice, injustice affected them in the same way that the shootings and killings of unarmed black men by law enforcement affect black women. And then lastly, uh, Jacob Bohr a researcher at the Boston University School of Public Health found that police killings of unarmed Black Americans negatively impacted the health of other Black Americans in the same state. So we're not even talking about community or region. We're saying that when news would break of law enforcement killing an unarmed Black American, it affected the entire mental health of all Black Americans in that state. There was an increase directly correlated to those shootings of depression in Black Americans. So when I started, I said, maybe some individuals may find that the connection between law enforcement and public health is a weird one. But I think when you look down and understand the history of black communities and law enforcement and the ways in which it impacts our bodies, it in fact, in fact makes perfect sense that policing should be considered a public health crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lawrence, for sharing that with us. Um, and thank you for explaining how policing is a public health crisis. We will open up the floor um, to take some questions. So um, 
you can either type the questions in the chat box or if you feel comfortable speaking, you can also unmute yourself to um, raise any questions that may, you may have. So Annie asked, um, she wanted to hear your thoughts on defunding police and reinvestment into our communities and how that will affect circumstances from a public health perspective. Yeah, I can, I can talk about this. Um, and I'll, I'll talk more about this more expansively at the third panel on July 22nd uh, at 7 p.m. Um, broadly right now, there are two categories of camps, right? On one hand, you have reform and you have people who are saying, well, policing is fundamentally okay, but we need to tweak a few things. We need to fix a few things. We have a few bad apples. Um, but then you also have the other camp, and I'm putting these two distinct ideas, but I think they're related, of defunding and abolition together. And the idea of defunding law enforcement departments is not this kind of punitive measure. We're not saying we need to uh, do this because we want to get revenge at law enforcement, but really it's an understanding that we need to invest uh, more funds into the things that we've been talking about, right? Mental health programs and all these things that we understand affect um, violence and crime in inner city communities. Uh, I mentioned this at a talk earlier this week. In 1968, there was something called the Kerner Commission that was uh, convened by President Lyndon Johnson. He didn't like the results, and so he ignored the report. But the report said if you want to understand why you have large amounts of crime and violence in certain communities, the answer is very simple. Two things, institutional racism and poverty. This report came out in 1968, 52 years ago. So for at least five decades, we've known that if you want to take care of poverty and violence in inner city communities, the way to do it is not to invest in more and more law enforcement. The answer is to invest in eradicating poverty and eradicating structures of institutional um, violence and racism. Uh, that idea was not like the majority of white Americans in a poll said they didn't like that uh, report and that paved the way for Richard Nixon who became uh, our first real law and order president who said the way you deal with these things is you have to over militarize policing and you have to just kind of be uh, very harsh and engaging these communities right these things tend to make things worse right so uh, I'm fully an advocate of defunding law enforcement fully because I understand that the idea is to invest in these things that will lower crime remember police departments don't uh, lower crime rates. Police officers intervene in a crime that's happening or they do the work of trying to figure out who did it and arresting the person and bringing them to justice or bringing them to the criminal justice system, whatever that means, right? But they don't reduce um, crime, right? That's, they just don't work that way. In fact, the trends nationwide recently have shown that even as we have reduced law enforcement officers per capita, we've also had a corresponding reduction in violent crime. So the idea of adding more law enforcement officers to um, to resolve crime is not a good idea. And that's the debate we're having right now. Um, I was part of a group that, that uh, petitioned Mayor Strickland to um, start thinking about defunding, kind of having a moral imagination to reimagine what society could look like if we were funding and really pouring into uh, black communities and making them healthier. And his idea was no, he didn't want to do that. He believes we need to increase the police budget to bring in more law enforcement officers, which just doesn't work. Real quickly, in New York City, they spend about five and a half billion dollars on uh, per year on policing and another five and a half billion dollars on pensions and benefits for law enforcement officers. So in one city, they spend approximately $10.9 billion a year on policing. Um, and we have to wonder how we could, you know, spend that money differently if we were to transition the money away from law enforcement, right? Ideally, and this is something I can't understand why everyone doesn't sign on to this. Everybody should want to live in a society where we have such low crime that we don't need large police departments. I don't know why that's not basic. Everyone should say that the job of all of us should be to work to the point where we need very small police departments because we've done such a good job fabricating society that there's low crime and there's not a need for police. Thank you for that answer. And I think this is a follow up question. Um, Charlie said, I've heard the origin of police was safe catching and were protecting property. What sources support the notion of police formed primarily for crowd control? Okay, so yes, um, in the South, uh, the origin of uh, policing often came out of slave patrols, right? And so we have examples, for example, of one parish 
in Louisiana where we have the charter, which actually says, and it's kind of amazing to see it, um, it says directly that you used to be the slave patrol and now you are in essentially the uh, police department, right? So you see that direct transition. Um, let me give you two sources. Um, I just want to get the name correct. So first, if you just Google this, uh, The Origins of Police by a gentleman named David Whitehouse. That's online. It's a free source. And then another one you can find online is a gentleman named Dr. Gary Potter at Eastern Kentucky University. So David Whitehouse and uh, Gary Potter at Eastern Kentucky University, both of them have amazing online resources about the history of policing. And uh, they talk about how policing initially was not at all about trying to catch criminals, but really was to um, deal with crowd control in the interests of the white and the wealthy and the elite. Great question, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hotz. Good afternoon, this is Dr. Uh, Opara. Can you hear me okay? Thank yes, you. Thank you. I'm assistant professor at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan, also director of our health equity and justice in medicine program and do a lot of work in the area of health disparities, health equity and social justice in medicine and healthcare. I also serve as um, on a uh, uh, an advisory board to our legislation um, in regards to health equity and disparities. So today our governor, Governor Gretchen Whitmer, announced mandatory um, implicit bias training for healthcare workers in response to the disparities um, um, highlighted and magnified by COVID-19. I'd like to ask both panelists, um, what is your viewpoint on the role of um, bias training uh, for healthcare workers in regards to reducing health disparities and for law enforcement in regards to addressing um, you know, disparities in, uh, in law enforcement and the cr criminal justice system um, as far as it concerns uh, black people, indigenous people and people of color. Uh, what role do you um, know what the evidence shows in terms of the effectiveness of these trainings or um, how to actually, uh, um, I don't want to say weaponize, that's not a good verb, but how to actually um, optimize them to be effective because I actually have my doubts. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Opara. Thank you for that question. I think it's a really important one. I am going to leave to Dr. Loins um, to say a little bit about the evidence about the effectiveness of implicit bias training. That's something that he has worked on um, quite directly. Um, what I want to do, though, is share your skepticism about how effective implicit bias training can be and propose instead that we think about instituting something that Dorothy Roberts and Jonathan Metzl have called structural competence. So what they propose is that instead of teaching people, you have these biases and you need to find ways to avoid acting on them, there's, that can be an effective thing to do too, but that instead of doing that, what we need is to help people learn to tell a different story. Part of what's driving these disparities is that we operate out of um, something I call agency bias, that we tend to explain uh, when something has gone wrong, we explain it in terms of individual choices. Well, you must have done something wrong. Um, and so we see somebody who's type two diabetic and we say, um, you're eating the wrong foods, you're not exercising enough. We're, we're, we're attributing the cause of that to the individual. What Dorothy Roberts and Jonathan Metzl propose is that we should instead train people to default to a structural explanation. And essentially what you do is ask, well, what's going on here? What are the, what are the root causes of this condition? Um, if you're not eating the right foods, then I need to be thinking about the neighborhood you live in, the foods you have access to, whether you have enough time to prepare foods from scratch. Um, I also need to learn about redlining and things like that. And so what they're proposing is that the, the more effective way of reducing these clinical determinants of health disparities that are driven by bias is to train healthcare providers in the, the structures that are producing disparities. And then they will begin um, um, seeking structural explanations rather than agential ones. Um, my instinct is that that will be a more effective path. Um, it has not been done 
widely. Like there's not structural competence training in health profession schools. And so it's not really something we can measure. I will say that I've been doing a lot of it <laughs> and that, um, that when I work with healthcare providers and medical students and we work on acquiring the structural competence, they respond to it with a sort of like, this is an eye opening moment in a way that I have not seen the same kinds of responses when we're talking about implicit bias. Thank you, Dr. Holtz, and I, I will um, second everything that Dr. Holtz just said. Um, back in 2016, a gentleman named Philando Castile was driving with his uh, partner and their four-year-old daughter, and they were pulled over in Falcon Heights, Minnesota, uh, not too far from Minneapolis. And uh, as the officer approached uh, Mr. Castile to, uh, you know, have an engagement with him, um, Mr. Castile, which did what the NRA said we're supposed to do, which is he informed the law enforcement officer that he had a weapon. Um, he wasn't reaching for it. He just wanted him to know so there wouldn't be a problem. Uh, the officer, as is typical, overreacted because the specter of an African-American man who was armed led into all of these uh, pre-existing biases, and he ended up shooting and killing him in front of his partner and in front of his four-year-old daughter. Uh, in response to that tragedy, um, Minneapolis PD decided they were going to do something about it. They spent millions of dollars to engage in implicit bias training. And in fact, they brought in someone who's very good at it. And um, for a long period of time, they taught the officers how to engage in de-escalation techniques, cultural sensitivity, um, implicit bias, and um, all of these things that we, you know, you would imagine the average person would want. Um, Two things resulted from that. First of all, someone who was embedded with the police department while they were going through training said that the overall attitude by leaders was that this is a waste of time. And then of course, secondly, we saw the results of that implicit bias training um, with the murder of George Floyd, right? Um, Minneapolis police um, is considered to be, police department is considered to be one of the worst police departments in the United States of America, which is odd because Minnesota is the only state that requires police officers to have a bachelor's degree. So they are allegedly the most educated police departments in the history in the United States, but you, we see what happens. So um, I share your skepticism, even though I, like Dr. Holtz, um, do a lot of implicit bias training. Um, I think the evidence shows that unless you deal with structures or you give people an appropriate framework for understanding implicit bias, then you can implicit train someone all you want to, it's not going to do anything. Furthermore, one additional point, we have to remember, um, policing is genetically problematic, right? Um, white supremacy is still the order of the day. It is still the genetic basis of our history in the United States that we're dealing with now. And law enforcement, their job, their role, whether they admit it or not, is to enforce white supremacy. And you can't implicit bias train that out of someone, right? So thank you. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Oya Karl Marquis. I am a pediatric neurologist at uh, Cornell Medical Center in uh, Manhattan. Um, so thank you for everyone for the wonderful um, lecture and the comments. I just wanted to add a, add a few things. Uh, a few of us are going through a, a faculty development course. We're focusing really on um, being scholars in health equity so we can go out and teach our colleagues and trainees. Um, and a lot of the same concepts have come up especially in my division, people have been so focused on implicit bias training and I had to stop them and say, that's only a tool. We need to get to the bottom of this. The, the real reason is why um, implicit biases exist. So I've been focusing on talking about racism, structural racism, and systemic racism with my group. Uh, in addition, um, bringing up the concept of social determinants of health, how that plays a role um, in our care. So the goal is really to develop the concept of cultural humility um, and that they're willing to continue to learn about this as an ongoing topic rather than assuming that they know everything and being kind of stagnant in their learning and, and um, uh, kind of fixed in their, in their perceptions. Um, thanks. I think that's a really terrific approach. Um, Dr. Moynes actually teaches a course called Developing Cultural Humility, so I will I will throw this to him in just a minute. I will say that um, one of the challenges I think is to recognize that even though implicit bias is the problem, that doesn't mean that training about implicit bias is the solution. But it might be that the, the better path to overcoming implicit bias is through this sort of positive training on cultural humility, on structural competence, um, 
And I think that one of the things we've got to get at here in our education system, and I see that in the comments, Dr. Opara has mentioned this as well, is that, um, that, that people want a quick fix. They want um, a one-time training. They want, here's what you can do and make this better. And that what we need to recognize is that this kind of education is formative. We tend to think of education as informative, that what we're doing is transferring information to people. But this is really a process of habit formation and character formation. And that means that it's going to have to take place in a sort of drip, drip, drip over a longer period. We're going to have to coach our intuitions so that we default to different kinds of explanations. And that takes time and it takes commitment. So we're not going to get a quick fix. We're not going to have a one-off training. Um, we're not even going to have a single course. Here at Rhodes, we have a post-baccalaureate certificate in health equity, which is a full year-long um, uh, course of study that students undertake, mostly as a gap year before going to med school. But we've also had some practicing professionals in the area doing the certificate. And the idea is that you're taking a deep dive into this material, spending a whole year, um, six courses, um, working, working that out. And then the other thing is, I'm going to put in a little pitch here for something else. Um, we have a grant at the college that has allowed us to produce a series of lectures on health equity topics, everything from uh, food access to um, working with sexual and gender minorities. Dr. Loins has a terrific lecture on cultural humility. Um, it's a series of about 10 different lectures that our community partners are able to make use of, and then they can schedule follow-up interactive Q&A with the faculty member who recorded the lecture. And so we're sort of hoping that this can be um, not, it's not really gonna be a substitute for the deep dive, but it's sort of an appetizer, where if you get, a, if you get an organization really committed to doing anti-racist practice of medicine, then here is a way through the door. You can, you can work through this series of lectures, you can be in conversation with faculty members, and by the end of that, you've got a pretty good sense of what you're up against, and then you can organize something for your um, institution that will be a sustainable structure to build, um, build anti-racism into, as Dr. Lloyds would say, into the DNA of your organization. And so just a little pitch there, if anybody's interested in that, you can be in touch with me and I'm happy to connect you with my co-conspirator, Dr. Cage, uh, who, can, who can help you get that lined up for your organization. And uh, the hours, we're almost done, so I'll just say very quickly, um, I'm certified with an organization called the Cultural Intelligence Center in the Grand Rapids area in Michigan, and uh, they've done decades of research on this. And so I do a course on developing cultural humility for a health equity program, as Dr. Holtz mentioned. But what data indicates that if you don't give people an appropriate framework for understanding implicit bias, it actually has the effect of making things worse because individuals will get training in implicit bias, they'll get a certificate or get, they'll get a plaque to put on their door. And then in a sense that inoculates them against charges of being problematic, right? Well, how can I be problematic? I got implicit bias training, right? I know A, B, and C what to do. So in addition to implicit bias training, you need to give them a thorough framework, which is what I do in that course on developing cultural humility. And I put my, I just put my email address in the um, chat for anyone who wants to reach out for more information. Thank you, Dr. Host and Dr. Lawrence for sharing, uh, sharing with us and coming um, to talk to us today. Um, if you have more questions, Dr. Lawrence provided his contact information so that you can directly contact him. We have, um, and thank you everyone for coming. Um, I think this is a really important conversation for us to have. We have our next talk on environmental racism on um, the 15th at 4 p.m. If you're interested, um, please join us again to have this conversation. And you can also follow us on Instagram, Serving Bluff City, and you can find us on Facebook as well. Thank you everyone for coming and thank you for our speakers. I appreciate your time.